Good morning. I'm Dr. Carol Scarlett with Florida Agricultural and Mechanical University. And today I'm going to be giving a guest lecture for the AP Physics Board. And this lecture is going to be on mechanical waves. So first, I'm going to start by giving some overview of what mechanical waves are and how we describe them. This lecture is intended for anyone taking the college board or physics exam. Okay, so what are mechanical waves? Well, if you've taken an introductory physics course, you've probably heard of things like collisions between objects, um, a baseball bat striking a baseball. And so you're familiar with the concept of one-to-one -one interactions and collisions. What distinguishes a mechanical wave is the energy is not focused into a single object. The energy is spread out over many objects. And so with a mechanical wave, you get a propagation or transfer of energy from a multitude of parts to the next multitude of parts. Mechanical waves can be either longitudinal, meaning that the wave travels in a single direction um, and that the wave, the, what, is what is considered wavy, is along that direction, or a mechanical wave can be transverse. Transverse waves involve displacements or movements that are perpendicular to the direction in which the wave is traveling. So waves can travel in all types of mediums, solids, liquids, or gases. Now let us take a look at what types of waves travel in what types of mediums. Solids can support either longitudinal or transverse waves. That is, in a solid material, you can have a slight compression of the atomic lattice to support longitudinal modes. You can also have displacements along the surface to support transverse modes. Liquids can only support longitudinal waves. There's no mechanical support for transverse waves in a liquid material. Um, gases can only support longitudinal waves as well. That means there's no way to support a transverse wave. In fact, sound is the result of compression and rarefaction of gas materials. And that is what you're using right now to hear this lecture. So let's take a look at what a longitudinal wave looks like and how it behaves. So here is an example of a longitudinal wave, which involves compression and rarefaction of components of the material. What you see are some areas appear to be more dense than others. And as a result, you can see that that uh, wave will travel in some direction, the same direction as the compressed and rarefied medium. Now let's take a look at transverse wave. So in a transverse wave, you have materials that are going to be displaced transverse or perpendicular to the direction of travel. As you see here, the displacements are up and down, and yet the wave is traveling from left to right. So a transverse wave then involves a perpendicular displacement. And as a result of that perpendicular displacement, we say that it, uh, the wave doesn't travel in the same direction as, um, as how the medium is displaced. Because a wave involves transmission of energy from one part of a system to another, it's important to understand some of the basic terminology in order to describe and to manipulate waves and in order to solve problems involving waves. Okay, so here's some basic terminology. Let us first look at what happens if we have a transverse wave. Many of you may be taking calculus courses or have completed a calculus course or will complete one. Or even in an algebra course, you may have encountered a sine or a cosine function. And you'll note that a transverse wave looks just like your sine and cosine function. And in fact, this is what we use to describe this wave. And what you see here is that the wave is characterized by having a peak or a crest and by having a low point or a trough. We refer to the total displacement from some average value, some uh, zero, we refer to that as the amplitude. And the distance from peak to peak or trough to trough is known as the wavelength. This is how we characterize transverse waves. Now for longitudinal waves, recall that these waves involve mediums where the material is bunched up in some regions, 
but that leaves the material stretched or rarefied in other regions. So in these type of waves, we have a rarefaction region where the material is less dense, and we have a compress compression region where the material gets more dense. And here, the wavelength or cycle length is given by the distance again from one compression to the next or from one rarefaction to the next. We also talk about with waves something called phase. Phase information tells you when does a peak or a trough occur relative to a time that you start observing it. So for example, for this wave here, the wave is not propagating. And so we would say that we just look at where this wave starts relative to some zero point, some arbitrarily selected or origin. Um, however, if this wave were propagating, then the phase information might contain a time component where we worry about when we turn our clocks on, when will the wave actually reach its peak and when will it reach its trough? And we're gonna take a look at wave equations so that you can better understand this. Okay, because waves describe the flow or movement of energy, wavelength can be related to something else we call frequency. Um, frequency refers to how often will a peak or a trough pass a given position in space. Um, and, the, and from frequency, we can also derive the velocity of the wave. This is how fast the wave is sweeping across a given position. So what we have here, the velocity is related to the natural frequency of the wave times the wavelength. The frequency of the wave is given by the amount of time it takes for one oscillation to pass some position. So this is known as the period of oscillation. Um, and then the frequency is one over the period of oscillation. Now we also have something called angular frequency. I mentioned earlier that we're going to talk a little bit about the wave equations that you need in order to mathematically describe the behaviors of waves. When we describe waves using sine, cosine, and exponential functions, we are very careful to use the natural, not to use the natural frequency, we're very careful to use the angular frequency. This is what enters our equation. So how do waves behave and how is their behavior distinct from say collisions with ordinary matter from a baseball bat striking a baseball or from a cup striking the floor. So here's what makes waves very distinct. Because waves are distributed among lots of particles, and because there's usually something holding those objects together, there's atomic bonds, or there may be some loose bonding if it's a liquid or a gas, then when you have a wave moving through space, it will react to a boundary or an obstacle very different than what you will observe with just uh, scattering. And we're gonna talk about three things that distinguish waves from other collision phenomena, and that is reflection, refraction, and interference. So reflection occurs when you have an incident wave on some barrier and the incident wave either cannot pass through the barrier or the incident wave um, will partially pass through the barrier. So in the case of optics, you can have scenarios where if this were a piece of glass, the incident wave may pass mostly through the barrier. So you may observe something on the other side, but some component of it will actually get uh, reflected by the barrier. And so what you see here is an incident wave coming in, and then you see the reflected component going out. Now there is something called the law of reflection, which we won't get into, but the law of reflection will tell you exactly what are the angles between the incoming and outgoing waves whether the wave is, when the wave is reflected or if the wave is transmitted. Another phenomenon that distinguishes waves is something called refraction. And this is a behavior where a wave is incident again on some barrier. And because it's incident on a barrier, the components of the wave that cannot pass through the barrier, that can't be transmitted, those components will start to break up in a way that allows the wave energy to actually navigate around the barrier. So in this type of phenomena, what happens is a wave experiences a barrier 
and fractions of the wave energy gets transferred around the barrier. It doesn't simply reflect from one point on the barrier. This again distinguishes waves from simple collision phenomena. Whereas for example, if someone were to throw a baseball at a wall or at some oddly shaped object, the baseball would bounce off at some angle depending on where it hit the object and what angles it made to the surface. A wave will have some component that reflects as we've already seen, but for wave mechanics, you will actually get components of the wave that will bend around the barrier. And this is known as refraction. This is a property of waves and collective behavior. Another property of waves that distinguishes them from scattering phenomena uh, that you're probably very used to is that whenever you have an incoming wave and you have some barrier, portions of that wave will bounce back and lead to something known as interference. So if you think of the red lines here as the highs where you have peaks in your waves, then what you see here is that some fraction of this ref uh, reflected wave now comes back and it interferes constructively and destructively with your incoming wave. So what results is that instead of having the same highs and lows as the incoming wave, the refractive waves will now interfere and you'll get these crosshatch patterns of highs and lows. Wherever the two waves are in phase, then you'll see a high. Wherever the waves are out of phase, you will see a low. And so instead of having just this nice smooth wave-like pattern, you'll actually start to have some structure or some hatching due to the fact that you have waves interfering. So now that we've talked about the uh, qualitative properties of waves and how we're able to distinguish waves from other uh, physical interactions, specifically from things like collisions, let's turn our attention to a few more equations that we like to use mathematically to express and describe wave phenomena. So let's start with natural and angular frequency. So you may recall that I mentioned that we describe the amount of time it takes for a wave to pass a certain position in terms of the uh, amount of, of, of the wave going from crest to crest or trough to trough. And we refer to that time as the period. And we use usually a big T to refer to it. Now we can define something called the natural frequency as I did earlier. And the natural frequency is simply one over the period of time that it takes for the peak to peak or trough to trough to pass some position. Now we can also define um, in terms of uh, angular quantities, we can define an angular frequency and the angular frequency is simply given by 2 pi times the natural frequency. Um, in terms of units, the period of time that it takes for peak to peak or trough to trough to pass a position, uh, that period of time is referred to in um, seconds, units of seconds. And so your frequency is given in one over seconds or something called hertz. All right, so now we're ready to write down equations that will allow us to describe wave behavior. Um, and we're ready to contemplate all of the phenomena we've just described. What happens when a wave hits the surface and you have reflection, refraction, um, how do you calculate interference and such? So let's start by treating a wave in terms of a sine and a cosine function. So there are a few ways that you see here how to write down a wave equation. The first, involves simply describing it in terms of a cosine function. But if you're going to describe it in terms of a cosine function, you should know that you're always going to have a phase component that has to be added in. So what does this phase component do? Well, let's say that at the time that I start observing at t equals zero, a cosine function, if you didn't have a phase, would simply be equal to one and you would be at a maximum. But what if I'm not at a maximum? What if I'm at a minimum? Then it may be more convenient to use a sine function instead, or you could still use a cosine function, but you simply have to add in a phase to account for the fact that you're 90 degrees out of phase or you're at a minimum. 
Conversely, you could always describe a wave in terms of a sine function. But again, what if at t equals zero, I'm not at zero? In that case, I would use a phase so that I can account for where the wave is in its cycle at the time that I turn my clock on. The other alternative is to use a combination of sines and cosines. And so this way, I can talk about what the phase is relative to t equals zero and what the phase is relative to 90 degrees. This does, it means I don't have to use um, a phase angle. Instead, I can use just sine and cosine functions, but note, I would have varying amplitudes for the cosine and sine components. And so you can sort of pick and choose which equations and which sets of equations are easier to use Certainly, if you choose to use sine or cosine, you simply have to worry about the amplitude and the phase. If you choose to use a mix of the two, then you will have two different amplitudes that you would have to calculate based on the initial conditions. Okay, so another interesting phenomena about waves and something that makes them very unique is a phenomena called the Doppler shift. Um, the equations in the previous slide apply to stationary sources and stationary observers. And here's what I mean by that. If I'm sitting by a beach and I'm not moving and I'm watching the waves form on the ocean, and I'm watching them propagate towards me, then the waves form out at some point, the source is stationary, I'm the observer, I'm stationary. And so I'm sort of watching this phenomena play out. I'm watching the waves roll in similar to the little videos that I showed earlier, where you just sit there and you watch from a single source a wave propagate in some direction. But what do you think should happen if I were running very fast towards the water or um, if some object, the, the, some source were moving very fast towards or away from me? Well, in that case, you would experience something called a Doppler shift. And what a Doppler shift is, it's when either the observer or the source of the wave, whatever's creating the phenomena, moves. And so when either of those moves, the frequency that you observe, the peak to peak or trough to trough, also has to change. So in the videos that I showed, if the source were moving towards me or away from me, you would get either that the wavelength for an observer moving with the wave is going to be different for them than what I would observe if the source of the wave is moving away from me or towards me. And this equation allows you to calculate the frequency that an observer moving with the wave would observe relative to the frequency that I might observe should either uh, myself or the source of the wave be moving. Okay, so now we get to the fun part. Now we get to problem solving. And let's review some of those concepts that we've been talking about. So constructive interference. So let's say you have these two waves, wave one and wave two. And let's say they're propagating with different velocities and they also have different phases. And you're asked to determine at what time will there be a complete constructive interference between these two waves. That is, if these two waves are propagating in space, at what point do they overlap in a way that both of them are at their maximum amplitude and they're constructively interfering? So how do you solve such a problem? Well, you start by setting the sum of the two waves equal to zero, because what we're searching for is a time, a T, when both of these waves will have their maximum amplitude. Then you can solve for what their amplitudes, uh, since they have the same amplitude initially, you can solve for what their amplitudes should look like. And you see that you have a sine function on both sides. Um, I recommend in this case using the following trig identity because this will allow, will allow you to um, re-express the phase information for both of these waves. Uh, if you use this trig identity, you get something like this. I've added in note a plus pi to one of them. And now I can simply do a straightforward solve 
based on dividing out the amplitudes and based on taking an inverse sign. And I can calculate based on the phase information when these two waves will constructively interfere. As a result of plugging in the parameters I showed you earlier, I find that the two waves will constructively interfere after about one second. Okay, now let us take a look at frequency shift. Let us try to understand what happens when the source of a wave uh, is moving relative to you. So many of you probably are familiar with the facts that bats use ultrasound in order to find objects. They use sound to navigate. What happens if a bat is flying towards you and it's emitting a sound? Uh, what should the frequency of that sound be once the sound bounces back to the bat? Okay, so the way you tackle that problem is you say, this is a Doppler shift problem. So the bat is now the observer, but the bat is also the source of the sound. So you use the fact that the wall can be treated, it's gonna bounce off of a, a wall or bounce off of you. The wall can be treated as a source. So the wave coming in strikes an object. The object now becomes the source of the reflected wave. So the source of that reflective wave now is moving relative to the bat. And this means that we can treat the observer, the bat, um, as receiving a wave, a reflected wave, from a source that is moving at 50 meters per second. We plug in all of our numbers and we find that the new wave has a frequency of 146.3 Hertz. Hopefully this has been really helpful to you. Hopefully I've been able to um, sort of highlight some of the features of waves and some things that we understand in general. And thank you very much.